What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bronx Pinstripe Show. The Yankees have won another series. We've got earthquakes in the Northeast. It hailed briefly on Saturday morning, and now we've got an eclipse rescheduling Yankees games. I don't know if the world is ending or this is just a good baseball season. Scott, what's up? Just don't look at the sun. Whatever you do, don't look at the sun. Whether the games, I think they were really worried about people looking up um, and uh, just like, a mass, like fly a balls? mass blind, like if no, a fly ball like a mass, <laughs> Oh yeah, that would be that would be something. Having a game during a solar eclipse, left field. Just I think like, it would have ah, been a. Ah. <laughs> it would have been a mass blindness event uh, at Yankee Stadium, which is uh, you know that would have been the first in history, and Yankees didn't want to go down in history in that in that manner. So, yeah, and then you're right, a fly ball. <laughs> a fly ball and and player gets blinded that's a big lawsuit the mlbpa will be screaming about way more things than uh, <laughs> they wouldn't need to clock. give them any more anim- ammunition on to shit to complain about <laughs> they made us play in a solar eclipse <laughs> it's like you remember in men in black at the end when the spaceship's going over and it's flying over shea stadium and the guy just staring up that's what it'd be like everyone's just yeah. staring up at the sun just going blind um, do we know why they had a scheduled afternoon Monday game and why there's multiple afternoon Monday games at home, like coming up? Yeah, the two o'clock. It was originally what two o five or something like yeah. that. Yeah, what's, what's with the Monday matinee? It's not a getaway day. It's the first game of the series. Like, what's going on here? I think they're just trying to do it like something different. Fine. I don't know why, but it's it seems like they've it's a few times <laughs> through the schedule. They really don't play that many Monday home games though. Like it's like a total of five. I, because, I, I because get Monday's it. Monday's traditionally an off day also, but it's also, it's that's a tough one for it's attendance. Monday or Thursday. That's what I'm saying. Monday in April, Monday afternoon in April, who the hell is going to that game? I get it. Like Monday afternoon in July, school's out, bunch of kids. You can have some summer camps there and all that kind of stuff. Like that yep. makes more sense to me. Yeah. Right? And, and it's, it's, uh, it's not like it's a, it's a major matchup that you're going to draw people in either. Oh, the, the one in nine Marlins. <laughs> <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting the Florida Marlins, the Miami Marlins here. I've called them the Florida Marlins like three times in the past two weeks. It's like my brain is reverting back to a a yesteryear. Yeah. In two weeks, they play uh, they play Oakland at one o'clock on a Monday. Oh, that's that's a really good matchup. The Oakland, you know, they're just going to be. Did they say this on the broadcast? They're just going to be the Athletics. Uh They're going to be like Cher or Madonna, just going by one name for for the next couple years. Wow, that's um. That, I mean, I don't know what they're doing. They're trying to compete with the attendance of a, of a, home, a home Oakland game at that point. I'm just going to call them Oakland from now on. <laughs> I'm gonna when compete. they're in Vegas, you're going to keep yeah. calling them Oakland? No, well, until they get to Vegas, I'm just going to – I'm just going to um, – I'm not going to – I'm not going to – the city of Oakland doesn't deserve that. They didn't this, – this, the, the athletics, the, the management – I mean, yeah, I see what you're doing with your head, but – because they didn't show up. But at the same time, the ownership is a complete dumpster fire yeah. and put out a dumpster fire of a franchise and, and a team every single year. It's hard to blame anybody but them. At the same time, so why are we uh, so why are we just calling them the athletics? Let's just call them Oakland. I, because not they're the not, city. I guess they're not, they don't, where are they going? San Jose, right? They're going to play in, is that where it is? Or uh, Sacramento. 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 Oh, they're going north. I thought they were going south to like where the uh, Niners stadium is. No, they're going to Sacramento to the minor league ballpark that is there. Oh, my God. The minor league ballpark is – I mean, the Oakland Coliseum is essentially – it's like a rat-infested dumpster. Like, that thing – I'm sure the minor league complex is much nicer than the major league complex. Yeah, it'll, and yeah, feel, you it'll can, feel more complete, too. You, you, okay, so you're, you're going to – actually, maybe Sacramento people will show up for a couple of years. They've got they've got a major league baseball franchise in their, in their town. So, like, yeah, some of those pictures from opening weekend of – the Oakland games where there was like maybe 72 people in the stadium. You're like, I can't count a hundred people in this overhead picture. It was insane for an opening, opening series, baseball, major league baseball. Yeah. It's sad, man. It's sad. This should never, it should never get to this point at all. And, and, you know, Vegas is becoming like USA sports town. Uh, So they're going to, they're going to do well. It's funny because the, the Las Vegas local community definitely has, they they got really behind the Vegas Knights, yeah. And they're they're you know the the Raiders now. It's like you're you're building this this hardcore football base is in a location. place that you wouldn't expect it. You wouldn't. But expect football's it. location proof. Well, I know, but it's hockey, hockey in Las Vegas. No, that that one was surprising, definitely. Yeah. And you get people in town for a weekend. It's like it's it's a fun event to go to. Like, what do you want to do? You want to go see a show, or you want to go see a hockey game, or you want to go see a baseball game? Like, a lot of yeah. people will choose I, the but sporting. But if you're going event. to Vegas, do you go for a baseball game if you're visiting? No, I mean, the answer, the, answer, but, the answer is no. But now if you're, if you're a Yankees fan, 
and you want to go to a weekend in Vegas, you can see a baseball that's game true. and you can go do your Vegas stuff. That's true. In one weekend. Yeah, that's true. And it's kind of, it, you know, for something like a, a Yankees game out there, it would be essentially a home game in Vegas. They're building a dome, right? That's going to be a, a that's got to so. be a dome. <laughs> so so. In the summer, it's like 115 degrees. Like I hope so. Talk about solar eclipse, uh, having some lawsuits, just people dying of heat exhaustion out there yeah. all right well we, we've wasted enough time what, what are your thoughts on on the homestand the opening homestand opening day wasn't so hot but the rest of the weekend was pretty good yeah they came back uh they came back from that first one they they you know it's when you um you you get these you get these uh offensive days where nothing happens and then you know all of social media starts going oh my god it's the 2023 yankees again it's the look at the batting averages look at all the like, they're like you know everybody's nitpicking all these things on there and um it's just a it was just a day it was just a day that that didn't go their 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 way uh, the fact that it's opening day people overreact if that of if course. the roles were reversed and they scored nine runs on opening day and got shut out the next day no one's saying shit they would say the same thing. They would say the same thing. Anytime okay. early on when there's zero offense, it, those, those, those come out. The, yeah. The, it's glaring. Come out. And also the way that the, it was like a messy game at the end where it's just like some wild pitches and stuff and, and just nothing was happening. Stroman pitched really well though. Like Stroman's, I mean, Stroman's, dude, Stroman's been, been really good. Really, really good. Stroman. First of all, he fits, he fits this team beautifully. He fits the fan base. He's, he's saying all the, all the, the right things on social. Like he's being grateful to the, to the fans, to the situation. And he's pitching his ass off. He's pitching his ass off. And he, he's, you know what? Like every every single time I see a camera on a group of Yankees, I feel like he's right in the middle of it, just yucking it up with everybody. It feels like he's just a a, a very good team guy, fits in well, and and has helped you know gel this team uh, together. So I'm really happy with him so far. He's he's been great. He's been their best starting pitcher. I mean, and I know it's only been two starts for the, for the entire rotation so far. But he's been the one that's gone deepest into the games, and he's pitched the most effective out of any of the starting pitchers. Because we're going to talk about just the starting pitching and the workload on the bullpen in, in a little bit. But Stroman has been the guy at least to get them through six. Like six doesn't sound like like it's like so amazing, but compared to everyone else going four and two thirds and and barely getting through five complete innings, Stroman pitching six in both of his starts has been much needed. It's been much needed. The the, the rest of this team needs to needs to follow suit and at least get through six for God's sakes. Who, the, but like you say that, but like, I know it's not the thing. It's not the thing. You're right. You're it's you're not right. just, I, it, it's just not, it's not that it's just not the thing. Look at like, it's not the Schmidt, thing for the players that they have Schmidt and heel specifically at the back of the rotation. So many pitches through four innings, five. There's no chance of them going six innings. They're heel. First of all, like they clearly are, have him on a pitch count. I know he doesn't have an innings count this year, supposedly, but he's got a game pitch count. And if he's at 98 pitches through four innings or whatever it was yesterday, you got no chance. I and think Clark it's part of Schmidt a ramp too. up though. Cause he was at 85. They pulled him at 85 in his first start. 84. One, yeah. They're getting, you know, close to a hundred. So it does feel like more of a ramp up than a, than but a my point is he's count. going to be a hundred pitch guy at some point around the fifth inning. Yeah, probably seems. he does. Because... need to. There's no doubt. He needs to, he needs to find the location. I will say, and I know we're going to talk about this game and the whole angel Hernandez uh, situation with him, but. Um, he, he just looks so much, he looks so, he does look like, like he's in control. He, and, and his misses are not missing by much. I, I, I do feel like he's on the cusp of, of really turning these three to four walk games into, you know, two walk games. I think if he can get away with like a couple walks, <laughs> two walks, two walks in two four walks, innings, two walks, life yeah. would be much better because he really does. It's not just feel... the walks though. Like think about all the deep pitch counts. Like everything was a two, two, three, two count yesterday. Yeah. He was going deep into counts and, and his, uh, and, but here's the thing with him also when, and I, I know this is kind of very similar to a lot of pitchers, but him specifically, what I'm noticing is when he, he does lose confidence in like the middle of an at bat. And I don't know if it's necessarily confidence, but focus or something he loses. There's a mental thing happening with him that, that needs to be, um, that needs to be really rounded out and, and, and dealt with. And, and I think that having him in the big leagues for a full year like this, you know, getting started with these guys, having Garrett Cole in his ear all the time, um, guys like Stroman, like there's, there's a, there's an opportunity for him to really mentally take that next step. And I think when he does that, at, and I think he's doing that, I don't think this is the same guy that came a couple of years ago. I think he's much more polished at this point. 
Um, and I've, I've mentioned this before, I think physically he's much more mature and, and really grown into his body. But that next step is like being able to tune out the bad pitch and just groove that 98 mile an hour fastball that nobody can touch and, and just you, continue to do that. Well, do you, are you saying like losing focus? Like, was that related to the Angel Hernandez stuff? Because obviously in this he, case, for sure, he, he let missed pitches, w- whether they were strikes or balls or borderline and that didn't go his way. He let that get to him. And I could, you could see it even with the timing, like when he would set back up and go, like he was rushing himself a little bit, there was something mental there. And obviously the Angel Hernandez thing had a lot to do with it. You got the whole crowd yelling F Angel Hernandez. You got the whole shtick, like everybody knows what to expect. If something goes <laughs> when, when, wrong. When the when entire 50,000 people know the, the name of the home plate umpire, it's not a good thing. Okay. No. 50,000 people should not know the name of the home plate umpire. And when you have a, a guy like Luis Hill, who you know, is, is a young guy who's got all the arm talent in the world. He's probably got the best arm talent on the, in the pitching rotation right now. You know, maybe, maybe you could argue that Radon uh, has it as well, Let's but not give him that. I would, I would take that argument and probably wipe the floor with you because of the way that, that heel is throwing. Like he's, and I'm not saying you, he's got three general. pitches. he has got three pitches automatically. That's a better arm. His talent. changeup is really good. His changeup. It is actually really is. So they, they were talking about this K K not K. Uh, yeah. K and uh, O'Neill were talking about this on the broadcast yesterday, how the 88 mile an hour changeup actually is plays like between the fastball and the changeup, like the fact that it is 10, potentially 11 miles an hour off based on his like max ramp fastball is enough. Ordinarily, someone's throwing an 88 mile an hour changeup and a 94 mile an hour fastball. You're like that, that's not a separation. Yeah, enough. He throws 98 miles per hour right. with, with movement. With so like eight, movement on it. 88 plays like 83. Yeah. It's a, it's again, the, the plus minus the differential is, yeah. is absolutely enough. And then he's got a, uh, a slider that's low nineties as well with a little bit of a, a sideways movement on it. He, he's got, he's got all the arm talent in the, in the world. And it's a matter of being able to, to hone in that ability and be able to, to dot the fastball. It's to me, it's all about that fastball. And actually he did throw, um, this was, uh, when they were working together, Wells actually called that change up in counts that I was not expecting him to throw a couple three, two, uh, uh, change ups that were that were thrown. Are you there, okay with surprised. those calls though? Because, like, especially with him, you've got such an electric fastball. I want him living and dying on the fastball. That's I want him what I'm living saying. And dying like, on the fastball, and I think that he continues to do that. And obviously, the the relationship between him and Wells, which is clearly a a battery that we're that we're looking at, um, that, that's happening more often than not. I mean, even now, Wells is 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 getting the. I'm not going to call it the lion's share, but he's getting what six to four, something like that. Um, at this point, I mean, but look at, look at Trevino at the plate. It is, it's, it's not good. Yeah. The, um, but I think that as that relationship grows too, you're going to see more reliance on that fastball. Um, because I do want him to live and die on that fastball. If he's able to dot that fastball, you know, I want you getting it. I want getting ahead in the count power pitch, use that slider, use that change up as, as more of the, uh, as more of an out pitch. Um, but yeah, he was, he was definitely trying to get a little cute. I think even when he was up and he was getting into deeper counts, they were waiting him out. Yesterday afternoon, I, I took uh, took the kids to the playground down the street. And so I was listening during the, the game. And this is at the point in the game when Giancarlo hit the Grand Slam. So yeah, what was that, the third that third inning, fourth inning that he hit the Grand Slam? But then Heel comes back out for the next inning. And John and Susan are, are doing their thing, uh, talking about, but really it's just complaining incessantly about how Heel just needs to attack the strike zone, especially like now they got him a lead and he's still out there and he's trying to be perfect with his pitches. Either he's trying to be perfect with his pitches or he's, I don't think he has the command to, to throw really. I mean, he, the stuff is obviously there, like you said, the arm talent, but the command is not there. So he's, he, he misses pitches. It's either an unhittable pitch or he's missing the pitch. And so that's why everything was a two, two, three, two count. Well, and that's a problem when you, we, I mean, obviously the command is, it's always been his thing. It's always been the, the issue for him, but you know, the, the command can be become more of an issue. If you are trying to paint the black, if you are trying to dot a, 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 a certain spot and you're, and you're, you know, overthrowing or any of that. So I think him just re- getting more comfortable and relying on the stuff of that 98 mile an hour fastball. And even if it gets a little bit more of the plate than it should, it's still a really hard pitch to hit. And once he, yes, once he that's... starts feeling that, once he starts feeling that and understands that completely, uh, then, then life will be a lot easier for him. And yes. that's that you see at a point now where we're, we're young guys. And I keep going back to, to Severino and, and the comparisons here, but 
again, a guy that didn't have to be perfect because his fastball was that good that he could, that he could absolutely um, live and die with it. Even if it were over the plate a little bit, it's a tough pitch to hit. Eat stress-free this spring with factors, delicious, ready to eat meals delivered right to you each week with baseball season back in full swing. You probably don't have a ton of time to get home from work and cook a nice meal before the game starts with factor. You can eat amazing and healthy food in just a few minutes. The process is super easy. You go on their website and choose from over 35 delicious meals each week. You can customize your deliveries with 60 add-ons that are available. Highly skilled chefs prepare your food. It gets delivered to you. It's always fresh and never frozen. You pop it in your refrigerator, and then when you're ready to eat it, heat it up in the microwave for about two minutes, and boom, it's ready to eat. You're eating a great meal. Factor is affordable and flexible. It costs less than ordering takeout, and you can adjust or pause your subscription whenever you want. I cannot tell you how much of a relief it is to know that I don't have to cook Harrison Lucy a meal, or I don't have to cook myself a meal after cooking Harrison and Lucy a meal and just be able to pop something in and have something that's going to taste good and also be healthy or not just eating crap. It has really been a lifesaver in that sense. No prep, no mess, just delicious food. Head to factormeals.com slash Bronx 50 and use code Bronx 50 to get 50% off. That is an amazing deal. Half off 50%. F-A-C-T-O-R-M-E-A-L-S.com slash B-R-O-N-X five zero. Thank you, Factor. Um. So we were talking about briefly, I wanted to mention also something, um, the, the catching situation with, with Wells, uh, getting more time than Trevino. Yeah. My, uh, I, I mentioned this before you didn't really acknowledge it. You had kind of like a shut the F up look on your face when I said it, but my bold predictions are looking really good on April 8th as of right now, just on April 8th. On April are we 8th. two weeks into the I'm season? Just, 10 games into the season, right? 10 I'm games. I'm, I'm getting ahead of the thing that you're going to say just so I can okay. put it out there. That's, that's a tactic. Well, well, which bold prediction specifically you're talking about? Well, certainly the Volpe one. I mean, spot on. I was right there. Great. It's he's looking great. He's going to be the leadoff hitter well before. We're going to talk uh, about that. We're going to talk about that. Um, Austin Wells, you know, taking taking the the starting catcher job. I do believe that we're already trending in that direction. And as you mentioned, Trevino is just, you know, when we first saw how does him, he not he get up, hold on? How does he not get pinch hit for in a one nothing game on opening day? Yeah, well, if you ask Boone, and they did, uh, reverse splits is the answer to that. But it doesn't matter. One's a better hitter than Shut the other. Shut up. Shut up with your reverse splits, Boone. Like, look at yeah. the game situation. You need a home run right there. And wh- where's Cabrera at that point, right? Isn't, isn't he one of your hottest hitters on the team? I think he is. And that kid, you know, yesterday, a couple balls over the plate. If you're throwing the ball over the plate to, to, to Cabrera right now, he's hitting the ball. He's, he's, he's making you pay for things over the plate. The, like, he is spot on right now. Um, but yeah, those are the two, the two big ones. I'd have to remember what my other three were for me to tell you if I were right or wrong. <laughs> too, too far in the past to remember what you said. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the reverse bliss thing kind of reminds me also of how they were talking about when Cabrera is hitting ready versus lefty. And that I, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's analytics based and, and it's the hitting instructors looking at pitcher splits and if a guy has a better split against a certain side, then Cabrera will adjust his his approach there. And I don't like I, I would don't isn't the old the cliche like play to your strengths, not the other, not the opponent's weakness. Yeah. And isn't I'm not that a big what, reverse split guy, especially if I'm on offense. If I'm on if I'm pitching, exactly it's it's really I'm just reiterating what you're saying. You're you're absolutely right. You play to your strength. So if you're pitching, that's your strength, right? A reverse split. If yeah. you're if you're at the plate, you gotta go with the better bat. You go with the yes. better hitter. It, it, but like if you're Cabrera and you've been so locked in from the left side, and you've hit against lefty on lefty against Hater, one of the filthiest lefty Stay relievers the left in the game. Yeah, and like I would rather you do that and just focus on hitting left because clearly you've gotten off to a hot start, and maybe you can carry that throughout the season if you just focus on hitting left. Um, Mark Teixeira talked about this. I, I know I've mentioned this on the show before, but like he said, as you got, as he got later in his career, it got so much work to keep both sides sharp that he had to do so much extra batting practice. It used to be, he just hit, used to have to do double the amount of batting practice to everyone else. He said, I ended up having to do triple the amount of batting practice just to keep each lefty and righty side sharp as he got later in his career. And I know Cabrera is not later in his career, but he's also not Mark Teixeira. Okay, he's not he's not a, a MVP caliber player in his career. Mark Teixeira was so Cabrera. Maybe just focus on what you're doing well right now and just stick with that. Yeah, no, I mean, 
there, we've, we've said this about a few people. Uh, we usually say it when they're struggling rather than when they're doing really well, like when they're completely like Aaron yeah. Hicks, just stick with one thing, you know, try to do one thing. Okay. But, but you're right. Cabrera uh, clearly is, is in a comfortable spot and, and he's seeing the ball really well and making very good contact. So um, I'm very happy with it. And, and uh, by the way, Ilya just pulled my other three, all looking good. This is amazing. April. I don't think I've ever been this right uh, on April 8th on of April my life. <laughs> uh, heel staying in the rotation, new age murderers row, new age murderers row with the, the 40 home run guys. That's looking good. hundred win season, all these things in line tracking really well that yeah through 10 games you've nailed we will it have, we will have games. updates every week i mean i right. that, like it was i super like i'm looking at my bold predictions uh juan soto for mvp okay yeah, well you know he had a good first week all right uh <laughs> nestor the nestor cortez stepping up in cole's absence not looking so hot yankees so having good. seven above league average hitters so far judge soto rizzo volpe all all and stanton all on track to do that need glaber to pick it up um and then we I mean, need wells to pick it up garrett cole time will tell what garrett cole is going to do when he comes back and yeah. also my prediction was that the yankees are going to beat baltimore out by a game to win the division and i know Ooh. the red Sox are in second place right now no one expects that to continue Baltimore. No, didn't they just lose Trevor Story point? also? Did they? Yeah, they they lost. Uh, yeah, they, it's, it was. It looked. I don't know what it was. I, I saw the. I, I saw, saw it happen, and it didn't look good. I don't know. Shoulder, maybe something. Uh, something with the arm. Okay. Devers saw it and immediately was like head on hand on on head, like not good, when he was right there. Hey. Yeah. Never. Never. Never wish that. Okay. That guy's had a really hard time staying healthy. Speaking of people not staying healthy. Yes, continue. As Johnny, I said, Lo- Johnny Loisaga, a guy that the Yankees deemed uh, as their two-winning guy, their Chad Green of the 2024 it's season. good to see Chad Green, though, this weekend. <laughs> it was good to see him back in action. Yeah. I looked up. I'm like, wait a minute. That's Chad Green. <laughs> the, um, the, yeah, UCL done for the season, you know, probably Yankee career at this point. The, maybe, I, you know, someone's going to have to give him a, a shot in the dark because every single season he gets hurt now. Uh it's just, it's, it's, I feel bad for him because he cannot stay healthy. Uh, it sucks because he's got all the talent in the world as well. And uh, he's just one of those guys that just cannot stay healthy. But also shame on the Yankees for, for expecting him to stay healthy, expecting him to be in a, in a role that was, obviously they believed that the, the two innings, the multiple innings uh, in the particular outing and then multiple days off was a good thing for him and his arm uh, clearly not. It's April 8th and he is. They didn't even get through two weeks of the season before he goes down. Like this didn't work at all. It's not like, oh, we got, you know, four months out of him and then it caught up. No, it's April 8th and he's down for the season. No one should be surprised by this. If you remember, uh, Ian Hamilton pitched into the third, into his third inning. uh, Whereas Loisica didn't take that. It's like Hamilton already took that. So if there was something happening and I know he says he woke up and felt discomfort, but there was clearly something going on. I think in that last outing that he was in as well. So um, it's just, I look it sucks. at this. I agree. It sucks because I, I'm with you. He has so much talent, but when you look at his injury history, 2019, right shoulder strain, 2020 undisclosed injury in September of 2020, uh, that he was on the COVID list uh, previ- uh, briefly in 2021. And then later in 2021, right shoulder inflammation, 2022, right shoulder inflammation, 2023, right elbow inflammation, 2023, September, right elbow inflammation. And now UCL sprain, uh, flexor strain, he's going to need surgery out for the season. Why? Did anyone think he was going to stay healthy? Like these aren't also look at all the things I mentioned for injury. Everything is in his right arm yeah. aside, aside from the COVID. Okay. Yeah. Everything is right arm issues for a right-handed relief pitcher. It's not like, Oh, he's got a toe. He's got a hip sore back. No, no. His right arm cannot stay healthy. And he's a right-handed relief pitcher. This is not going to work out for him. Yeah. It's unfortunate. There's something obviously in the way that he throws that doesn't doesn't like his his arm does not like his arm does not like the 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 mechanical motion that that he uh, that he uses and puts that much strain um, on his arm. Clearly, so uh, it's unfortunate. But now we're looking at a bullpen that has who who are the the guys that you can rely on? Ian Hamilton, I think is 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 in that in that bucket, even though uh, his last outing not so great. 
but the he's a guy that they've they've uh, deemed as a reliable guy. We saw he's been very good uh, over the last year, um, thus far up until this last blip. He's been very good, and then Clay Holmes. Clay Holmes is is that guy who I mean you have to you have to rely on Clay he's Holmes. The closer. You have and, no choice, and he's he's got a, a proven track record. He's gonna the the ball will be in play, so it's a matter of you know him missing barrels, making sure that. You know, he's, and he's done this. Like, I, I, I do feel good about Clay Holmes. I think that there's uh, one guy in there, hundred percent. I feel good about him. No doubt. Everybody else, literally, Fergie? How you feel everybody about Fergie? else is an unknown there to Ferguson. me, even though they have a, a relatively, and I know that they've played, uh, Ferguson has a, a track record. It's not that great. He's get, these guys have some track record, but birdie is, is uh, kind of a, a new rel- re- revelation uh, in the way that the way that he's been throwing. So, over a sustained amount of time, there are there's really not anybody in this bullpen who gives me that that uh that that really good feeling outside of um, Clay Holmes and Ian Hamilton. The bullpen is going to have to be addressed sooner than later. Like like it's I it's think not even going to be active from now until you have game. to be. You're not even two weeks into the season, and your bullpen has pitched four and a third innings per game. They've pitched forty and two thirds innings over ten games. That ranks fifth in Major League Baseball. The Dodgers have the most innings pitched out of their bullpen, but they've also played two more games. But they're still on average per game pitching four and two thirds innings. And then Miami, who is one and nine. Okay, Miami's garbage. That that's why their their bullpen is up there. The Padres, who also I think played extra games because didn't they play uh, the Dodgers to start the season? Um, where they play Taiwan or or Korea, wherever yeah, they, they played. played Korea, yeah, Korea. Korea. Uh, the Cubs, then the Yankees, then Oakland. Oakland also garbage. Okay, so the Yankees averaging over four innings out of their bullpen on a daily basis. It's, yeah, it's un- not sustainable. Unsustainable. Whether you have. You could have you could have the best bullpen in baseball, and it's not sustainable. You could have you 2016 Batances, Miller, Chapman, plus some other people in there. But, you're not getting this every night out of your bullpen. It's but too, here's it's the thing, too like, much. I know, I know what you're going to say about the depth of the starting rotation and where they're supposed to track. Uh, but at this point in the season, when you're looking at a bullpen that has a lot of innings pitch, it does make sense, and it happens every year because – guys are brought along a little slower. So you do get more bullpen innings or in April you, you do. So it's more about the arm talent for me than, than it is. And it's, it's a combination of both. There's no doubt, because I think to your point, the depth of the rotation is going to be an issue probably for the entire season. And Until Garrett at least Cole coming the second back, half. We don't know. We don't know, right. you know, how deep he's going to go, whether he comes back at full strength, if he's able to sustain that full strength, um, you know, ability, it's an unknown. We, 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 we can, you know, put some good feeling on it because he says he's, he's going to be right and all those things. That's great. Uh, but the rest of that rotation and, you know, Ilya pulled some stats when we were talking last time about, about Radon, like tr- he is, he is a five to six inning guy way more than I realized. He, he does not get oh, like throughout and his I, career. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought in my brain that he was getting more depth and he's just not a guy no, that does but- that because he throws a lot of pitches. <laughs> I think we're still stuck in the good pitchers pitch seven innings. Good pitchers pitch six innings now. The best pitchers pitch seven innings. But you good know where, it also, pitch six where it also comes down to, and and this is a topic obviously that's going through baseball, kind of alluded to it earlier with the MLBPA talking about the pitch clock and how all of these arm injuries are happening because uh, Strider just went down. There's a bunch of arm injuries that are happening and they're happening to Bieber. big name guys, which is Bieber, which is, it's not fun for anybody. It's not fun for the player, the team or the fans. This is, um, hold on. This is Bieber's second Tommy John, right? Didn't he recover from Tommy John a couple of years ago? Remember when he was yeah, coming Tommy back? John, he was out. Remember, I thought I we talked about Tommy this John. when he played, when the Yankees played Cleveland in the, what year was that? The 2022 playoffs. Remember he didn't pitch game five. And um, it was because I thought it's because he was re, he he this was his, that was his first season back from injury. Anyway, keep going. My point is my point is, is when you see all these guys now with the power pitching uh, trend that has been here for a bit, everybody throws in the high nineties now. Everybody's looking for the the, the strikeout. When you have a uh, higher strikeouts, that means you have less bat to ball. That means you have less ground balls, less fly balls, more pitches. And therefore, more pitches. You know, if you have a guy that can pitch to contact then it's not a bad thing. If, if you could pitch the contact and do it and do it well and be able to, um, you know, and Nestor in, in, at times has done that. Uh, I think Clark Schmidt has the ability to do that. Guys who can get ground balls, Gosman has done it, even though he's also led the league in strikeouts. Um, but 
you see a lot of you see a lot of these guys who are just so dependent on the strikeout that they're missing the bats uh, enough to to go not be able to go deep into games and 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 I know you have the top tier guys who are still big strikeout guys that can do that because their stuff is there and they're able to you know not go deep into counts they're they're able to put guys away when it's time Cole's a great example of that but um, the the fact that you don't have that third fourth and fifth guy in the rotation that's able to pitch the contact he's still trying to get strikeouts that's a problem. And that's that's what's happening throughout baseball right now. So it's the just, bullpen's going to get worked. Yeah, the the um, the fears we had about the pitching depth going into the season are already coming to fruition with not only injuries but also the rotation not going deep into games. And when you look at what they did in this bullpen in the off season, it was they acquired some pieces as like middle to back of the bullpen guys. They didn't go out and really add uh, any elite talent in the bullpen. And if anything, they lost. They're the one of the most elite talent out of the bullpen. And if you want to call Michael King, um, who's going to be a start, whatever, like he, he, they lost him, not saying they shouldn't have done that trade, obviously, but they, but again, he was not going to be a bullpen guy either. So whatever he, they pulled him out of the pitching depth though. Okay. They pulled him out of their pitching depth and they were relying on the who did not take a genius to know this, this was, that was not going to be sustainable. And, and they didn't really have a, a backup plan to that. And so, yeah, Cashman has to definitely be active to try and add more bullpen arms sooner than later. You're going to see some of these guys in AAA that were, um, you know, in the in the minds of a lot of people, going to be depth in the rotation. They're going to have to get flipped. They're gonna they're going to have to do that with guys that they probably didn't want to. Uh, to see if they can't find someone in the bullpen because you're not going to be able to go out. And I know he's going to have to be active Cashman on the trade market. He's going to have to be active and, and continue to look for people, but you can't just rely on that. They're going to have to figure something out in the, within the system. And that's going to take some, some experimenting. Canley, Canley's coming back too. We forgot to mention. Him. Okay. But how, for how long? <laughs> yes. That's, that's another thing. If you're looking, if you're thinking about going to a sporting event soon, especially a Yankees game, then you need to be using game time for your tickets. Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of major league baseball, meaning buying tickets to a baseball game on game time is faster and easier than ever. Wednesday's game against Miami has a ton of great seats available, including multiple flash deals going on right now. I just checked before we started recording. Or if you want to just get into the stadium for as little as possible, I saw some tickets for $11 all in pricing. Scott, can you even get a beer at, at inside the stadium for $11 these days? Probably not, right? Probably cost you at least 12 bucks. Beers are expensive. Not, they're, not, uh, they're not cheap seats. That's for sure. So you could, you could get in the stadium in a seat in the upper deck for less than you can to buy a beer. That's pretty good. The game time app has a ton of great features. Some of my favorite include the flash deals. So you know what sections the best deals are in the all in pricing. So there's no surprise fees at checkout and your seat view. If you're sitting in a new section around the stadium, you can know what you're going to get before you buy game time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets to sporting events, but you can also find tickets for concerts, comedy shows, theaters, and much more. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find a ticket in the same section and same row for less money somewhere else, game time will credit you 110% of the, dif the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code Bronx for $20 off your first purchase term supply. Once again, create an account and redeem code B R O N X that spells Bronx for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Do you want to talk about, uh, about our guys? You want to talk about Michael King real quick? What? So his last start, seven shutout innings. Oh, I didn't see that. Good for yeah. him. But the two before that, not so great. <laughs> Listen, I, as much as I love Michael King, I like Juan Soto uh, more. Okay, uh, I'd rather have Juan Soto. He's he's he well, I, he's thrown fourteen innings in three uh, in three starts. His first two starts did not go so great, but he did just uh, just lock it in. The, 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 the funny thing is, is that no matter who you are across the league, unless your name is Garrett Cole or just like one of the top five to 10 guys and you're in five, five baseball, plus, it's a five you're plus five to six inning guy. That's just the way it's going down. How long do you think major league baseball will ever change the official scoring rule on a win? Eventually probably yeah, because just, five innings, because they need to, they, they want things to look good. Five innings of, of a threshold used to be like, Oh, you can't go five innings. You're a loser. Now it's like you got to get through five innings. Like it's it's a struggle to get through five innings for some of these guys. And and like to the credit 
credit. I don't know. It, whatever. Some of these Yankees pitchers who are getting into the fifth inning, pitching well, but just too many pitches, Clark Schmidt, Luis Heel, you're like, well, I guess they deserve the win in the context of this new game, but they are ineligible for the win because they can't get through the fifth inning. They can't get so through maybe the that, fifth inning. Maybe that's what, when robo umpires come, maybe there'll be an umpire because they're going to have to give a job to umpires at that point, right? Maybe there'll be like the common sense department in that sense. Who deserves the win? They, that already exists, actually. You know that? Yeah, but there's still a criteria. I know it exists, but the criteria. Yes, there's a criteria. You have but to hit a certain thing. We'll the, starting that, pitcher, the starting pitcher. The starting pitcher. Has now to openers hit five can innings. get wins. Now openers can get wins because you have a Angel Hernandez is deciding who gets the win. Right. The starting pitcher has to pitch five innings, but they can award a win to a relief pitcher, yeah. even if that pitcher was not the pitcher of record. Nine times out of ten, it's the pitcher of record. But if someone else like comes in and locks it down for two innings, they might just award that guy the win, even if they didn't take the lead while he was the pitcher of record, which is weird. Well, and that's the scorekeeper. Is the scorekeeper making this? I think it's uh, the scorekeeper, the same guy who's judging errors and crap like that. Yeah. Interesting. And and the 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 scorekeeper also like is every home team has a scorekeeper, so that's why a lot of times you'll see more generous things for for the home team. Or if 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 like for like Volpe had a had a, a base hit on a infield an infield hit the other day. Um, that maybe it in a way park's not a hit. Maybe it's an error. And then it's like, maybe if, uh, if they do change the criteria for a win, guys will just get wins for, you know, as for contract incentives and things like that. Right. Like oh, the then, score, yeah. the scores. Well, that, it just opens up a whole other animal for, uh, for prop bets now too. If you, if yeah. you change that criteria now, it's, if it's up to someone, yeah, I actually I take that back. I don't think they're going to do that now with sports betting. They're not <laughs> everywhere. Do that. Yeah, yeah, because Major now you baseball you just need to find who to get, and it's like yeah, you need to find who the unnamed person is to get to to you know to to break. That that feels too easy. You need someone with integrity. Yeah, but they also have to have accountability, so their name needs to be public. You need to know who they are. <laughs> or otherwise, needs- otherwise the 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 random man or woman behind the scenes who is judging the uh, the win and all these other statistics, if they're if they're uh, if they're compromised, it's a problem. And when but- with no accountability, the percentage of them being compromised or on the take, a lot higher. What if you have a committee? So it's like 10 people who are the scorers and then you just take the majority. So you're, it's, it's harder to buy off 10 different people. Yeah. I don't know. I'm rewatching the Sopranos right now. So I've, I'm, I'm looking at things a little differently. Every, I'm everyone's season, I'm in season everyone's two. on the take. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of garbage needs to get taken out. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned Volpe, but let's talk about the leadoff hitter situation with the Yankees, because there was an interesting stat mentioned on the broadcast yesterday that Glaber Torres has seen the most pitches in major league baseball second most uh, pitchers in Major League Baseball, coming into Sunday's game at 180. And he's been the leadoff hitter, and that's a quality of a leadoff hitter you want. See a lot of pitches, make the pitcher work, so that he's, uh, especially going into Soto and Judge and the rest of the lineup, has already thrown like six or seven pitches going into that. That that is a good quality to have. Um, But Volpe is definitely making a case to hit leadoff. We've talked about how maybe at some point this season, if Volpe's playing well, they will move him to that leadoff spot. With DJ LeMahieu, still sidelined it's a nat- it's kind of like up in the air they put glaber there by default but we thought maybe we'd, we'd see verdugo there on certain nights we haven't it's been glaber's job so far verdugo Gla- has also done nothing to to you know make the case for sure. him to be there against but he, he had splits against even against if the against matchup's righties. right he had matchup splits against righties that look good you know for a career glaber yeah. torres on the season, 47 plate appearances, 250 batting average. He's had 10 hits, a 340 on base percentage, which is is not bad for a 250 on base or t- for a 250 batting average, but a 97 WRC plus, so just worse than league average. 10% walk rate, which is good. 21% strikeout rate, which I, I I would venture to guess is pretty much in line with his career. He seems to be like a low 20% strikeout guy. Volpe, on the other hand, 38 plate appearances, 424 batting average. He has 14 hits, 486 on base, 226 WRC plus. The the, the WRC pluses can can skew up and down this early in the season based on a good day or a bad day. Also a 10% walk rate, slightly less strikeout rate at 18% for for Volpe. I still think it's probably an early, uh, too early in the season to to make that switch. But two weeks from now, if things are are looking similar. You got it. You got to pull that trigger. 
I'm interested to see how Volpe goes through a cold streak and what that cold streak looks like because last year we saw moments. Um, I don't think he ever had a 10 game stretch this good. Not, not this, not not completely sustained, but we definitely saw hot streaks from yeah. him, uh, and and we saw it early in the season also where he was a lot more active on the base path. Like he he definitely started out uh, more hot, and you know obviously the there's a revamped swing O'Neill. And the guys have talked about it a number of times in how clearly it's it's much more flat through the zone. He's going to get a lot more contact, uh, and and we saw this during spring training. That was partly why I was talking, you know, in my in my predictions of of him, you know, lessening the home runs but increasing the uh, you know him being on base. The the, the batting average is going to be higher. Like I think this is the right adjustment for that guy. He doesn't need to be a thirty home run guy. He's much more effective for this team if he's a 20 home run guy and getting on base at a, uh, you know, a, a much higher clip um, and, and hitting gaps and, and active on the base path. Like that's where we want this guy. I, you know, I really do. I feel like him, him as the, the more traditional leadoff type guy, it just fits his game. It fits his style uh, very nicely. So I don't think it's going to be a huge rush to get him there. Uh, but right now you can make the argument that he's clearly the guy that should be there, even though Glaber Torres, I think, I mean, the numbers aren't fully there with, with the, 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 the numbers everybody looks at, but the fact that he is working the count, he's, he, I thought he's, I think he's been a very good leadoff hitter so far in the, in the way that he has given um, the team an opportunity to, you know, see more pitches. He's, he's done the work ahead of Soto and ahead of judge so that these guys can, uh, you know, start to feast a little bit, but you know, as the season shakes out, we're going to see that there will be a, uh, there will be a right-handed bat that, that is going to uh, glaringly be the obvious leadoff hitter. And I, I I don't know when LeMahieu gets back, if, even if he, you know, depending on how he is and how where where his mobility is, like does he does he not then become more of a run producing guy? Is he more of a run producing threat given the DJ or Glaber? Both of them. I mean, definitely Glaber, but but DJ, uh, you know, I don't know how much this foot injury is going to hamper the way he plays, and maybe it won't at all. Maybe it will, but. Um, you know, if he's more of a, in a, in a run producing situation than, than lead off or a guy that needs to get things going, you know, maybe that's a better spot for him at this point in his career. DJ was going to be the leadoff hitter until he went down. Yes, he was. So DJ, the latest update on him is he, uh, took batting practice. Boone said, I don't think he's that far off from playing in games, but he's been down now for some time. So you want to get him against live pitching and then games to build him up again. And LeMahieu said that he would not need many rehab games because he basically had a full spring training. Best case, let's call, let's like map out a best case scenario here. May 1st, DJ LeMahieu is back active on the roster. I would say he probably gets slotted in as the leadoff spot. Glaber moves down to the fifth or, or I guess sixth spot or fifth or sixth spot and Volpe is hitting down in the order. That would be how I would think it would happen unless Glaber Torres goes in like an 0 for 10 slump right now and Volpe has you know continues this again they might just do something quick and, and, and move Volpe up there but I would say that if DJ's back fairly soon he'll slot back into the leadoff spot I don't know that that's the right thing to do but I think that's what they will do it, it's going to be tough to 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 put Volpe further if he continues to hit and looks as good as he does in the in the batter's box it's going to be tough to to, you know, at the end of the day, give him less at bats. Cause that's what you'd be doing uh, in, in the yeah. scheme of things by, by putting him in that nine spot. Is it that nine spot to turn it, turn the, the lineup over again? And, and that was a spot that, you know, if DJ's ahead of him and then obviously Soto and judge are there, like Volpe's going to feast. That, that was another reason why I'm thinking of him in the nine spot for a long time in the season, the man's going to get a lot of, a, a lot of pitches. He's going to get a lot of pitches and there's going to be a lot of pitches over uh, the strike zone. And if he takes that step, in this discipline, in the plate discipline, then he's going to do really well. And the fact that he's kind of tailored his swing to make more contact is it just suits the situation that much more too. So whether he's in the nine spot or the leadoff spot, he's going to see a lot of pitches because of who's in front of him. Um, but I think it's going to be tough for him for, for, I think it's going to be tough for Boone to say, DJ's back. We don't know what to expect, uh, but we're going to put him right back in the leadoff spot and we're going to put Volpe down in the lineup. And stick Glaber Torres who has not hit yet has had good at bats though. Like to, to that you made a good point there with Glaber that even though 
the results aren't there. The at bats are still okay, and he's seeing like if he was going up there striking out on three or four pitches a bunch, like then you say okay, you got to get him out of there. But um, like I, I don't feel that it's a it's a non competitive at bat when Glaber Torres is no. Is in up. fact, it's quite the opposite. He, you know, he's uh, if if you told me uh, to predict what his numbers were after watching him for the season without looking at the numbers, I would I would definitely have thought they were better than they than they well the, the right probably yeah because of the at-bats does he does he have an extra base hit he's got to right if if you guys could look that up quick i can't think of an extra base hit while they're looking that up got to tell you about unified whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like us we understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance Loisica is the latest Yankee to hit the shelf, but Cole has had some positive updates uh, recently, so more on that in a minute. That's why I'm, I am excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Bronx Pinstripe Show. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System or EE system. If you haven't heard of the EE system yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you are in the New York City area like me or hundreds of other locations around the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. If you're interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself, go to unifiedhealing.com slash Bronx to learn more and find a center near you. That is U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash Bronx. No material or testimonial on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime, including EE system. Does Glaber have a extra base hit? Two doubles. Two doubles. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the numbers are probably what I would expect. I mean, th- 340 on base percentage for only hitting two. Like when you're on base is 90 points higher than your, your batting average. That means you're at least still like – having good at bats yeah that's you know whether those are hits or walks he's on base so as a because you don't hitter, it actually doesn't matter the thing is like 340 on base percentage is kind of what glaber is even when he's hitting well because when he's hitting well if he's hitting 275 or 285 he's still a 340 on base percentage guy at least that's what he was yeah. about last year yeah so it's a matter of him you know making more contact or or taking those pitches which is a good thing like the fact that he's that he's seeing uh the ball the way he is and working the count again i think the that batting average, if you care about it, it's going to go up. It's just a matter of, of of time because he's seeing the ball well. Yeah, and that strikeout in the first inning yesterday when the pitcher was Francis stepped off and then stepped yeah. back on really quickly, quick pitched him. Glaber thought it was going to be a timeout, took a pitch, which also looked to be high. Classic Angel Hernandez calls it a strike. That just sets the tone for just like, oh, everyone, like, oh, really, Angel? Really, we're doing this today, Angel Hernandez? And then the stuff with Heald, which we already talked about, um, it's just – how is he still employed by major league baseball? I'm not, I'm usually not a guy to just rag on umps and, and blame umps for everything, but Angel Hernandez and like how many years does everyone have to universally hate this man before major league baseball is like, maybe we don't want to employ you anymore. Yeah. And you know, we were talking about this beforehand, even more in depth. Uh, it's bleeding into what we were recording, to be honest, as far as my, uh, whether we talked about the specific things, because when he talked to heel, like there was a whole back and forth, when he started getting, when he wasn't getting some of the pitches and he was, his body language was showing that he wasn't getting the pitches. One, he's not, he's got to not do that. And understanding that Angel Hernandez is behind the plate is, is part of it. So again, that's a, that's, that's just growing up and understanding what you're doing and who's the, you know, being perceptive to what's going on in the game, who's behind the plate, their tendencies, all of those things. Uh, so someone's got to be in his ear about that. Like I, I expect a veteran pitcher and I know Boone talked to him directly afterwards, but we got to get ahead of that. You got to, he's got to know exactly that body language with Angel Hernandez means something different than body language with a, a, a different umpire. And the fact that he is uh, a guy that, that will take into consideration you showing up the umpire, you getting a borderline pitch or not is it is a is part of the process here it's part of the we don't have robo umpires yet this is a this is part of the process and it's a known commodity behind uh behind the plate so hernandez is you know not calling those those borderline pitches a lot of them were not strikes that that he'll missed they were off the plate but it, it bled into 
you know, Hernandez making sure that heel is looking up and doing all of these things, you know, making eye contact and, and acknowledging that he's ready to deliver so that there's not a pitch clock violation and, and constantly communicating about that. And you could see it in Luis Hill's body language that he was rushing. He was, he was flustered. He was frustrated. And then after the inning was over, cause he got out of that, that inning with one run across, which was a, a miracle given the situation and under, it felt like there was about to be five uh, runs across the, the plate. You know, Hernandez had a longer conversation with him uh, when he was checking his glove and explaining why he was making the the um, the gestures towards him. And clearly, this is Angel Hernandez gaming the situation a little bit too, making sure that he understands who's in charge here, who is the the person that is going to be dictating the pace, dictating what happens uh, on on the field. And that's what a lot of people hate about Angel Hernandez. So you could. You can hate him or you're not, but you know what he is. You know what he is. And a young player just has to be uh, be able to put that behind him and, and push forward. Angel Hernandez is 62 years old. I – he – I'm trying to th- see how long he's been an umpire. Looks like since 1991. Jesus. Th- shouldn't there be like a statute of limitations on how long you can be an umpire? Like – isn't that a point like, hey, you've been doing this for too long, maybe? I don't think that's his problem. Is that though. ageism? Man, that, yeah, that, that is exactly what ageism is. It's a, <laughs> literally a textbook definition of ageism. Uh, been doing it for well, 34 years or whatever, 33 years. Th- I mean, the strike zone, nothing's, not, not, a, not a lot has changed uh, in, in baseball in the sense of the things that he gets wrong. It's still the same shit. It's the strike zone. It's, that hasn't changed much. Like Angel Especially Hernandez now because is. you can review everything else. You miss a call at second base, it's going to get overturned. Like, yeah, the strike zone is the only thing now. So it's a matter of him just uh, asserting his personality. That's the, the bigger thing. And then just straight up being wrong. He's just wrong, and it's more glaringly obvious that he's wrong now because of all the technology. Are we – now, I was going to say, are we because we're so close to baseball, like, just – like, we – like, there's a lot of – umpires over the years like cowboy joe west the guy uh who missed uh the perfect game well i uh i can't think of his name but i can see his face Poor jim bastard, uh yeah. jim joyce right jim, yeah, joyce? jim joyce that's right uh angel hernandez obviously but then i was like do other leagues have this that i remember like how ed hockley every time yeah, he there's on the a microphone lot. would go viral so yeah it's really like umpires and um referees or whatever just around leagues like anybody everyone. who's officiating a game is going to always be scrutinized yeah. Beyond belief. And it's going to always happen. Uh, and, and even, you know, and, and when they get Roto, Roto uh, strike zone, we're going to figure out something else to bitch about the human beings that have a, oh, yeah. have a, a that's what I'm worried happened. about. Actually, is that people are actually going to complain more about the robo strike zone than they are the human umpires. Yeah, I don't know. I think the, the box on TV didn't do anybody any, any I've favors. said that. That's the worst thing that ever happened for, for umpires is the box on TV because that's not even truly accurate what the strike zone is because of, of how we're viewing it on a 2D screen versus a 3D thing. Like that's not yeah. – that's not – I mean, To it's, me, it's, it's always low. It's always – that strike zone is so textbook like knees to, to, to like waste. Letters? To, it's not to the letters. It's not to the letters. It's a square, not a rectangle. Because this is something that is being digitally placed on the screen by producers. Every app producers bat. are not no no there there is a there's technology that is picking it up based on the size of the batter and their stance. Yes, because like if someone has got a Jeff Bagwell stance, that strike zone is going to be different than if someone's got an Aaron Judge stance. Yeah, it changes. Digital, like this is this is not Digital, a producer. Yeah, they've advanced. I'm I'm they've, picturing someone with like uh, the teleprompter drawing a little box. No, nah, they you know uh, technology is a little bit further past that now. No yeah. one's no no one's drawing the strike zone at this point. That's, what technology? Uh, we've talked about this before. What technology does pro tennis use? Because that thing is like laser perfect instantly. It's the same. It's the same one that we talked about this because they do have it. They they use it in soccer now too. Um, it's uh, the tracker system. I don't know if it's the latest one. The but there's the it is available. You you can now look at on soccer, baseball they have doesn't it going down it. the line, down the line of the of the goal line. They we yeah, there's the, the technology absolutely exists. It hundred percent exists. So but baseball mean, th- think doesn't about how many exist. fucking cameras there are in stadiums. <laughs> it exists. They could get they could get anything they want. I wonder 
when and if Robo, because I know they're testing Robo umps in the minors, but and there is a home plate umpire, but the home plate umpire is not calling balls and strikes. He's just there to stand call catcher's and, interference. Yeah, but I mean, <clears throat> so I wonder if they're doing this where the umpire is still calling the game, but there's also a Robo strike zone tracking how much it matches up with the human call versus the robo call in in a given game and like what the variance is it'll be interesting how they do it too because i think in uh, in other sports like there's an opportunity if if a call is wrong that like a beep happens and then it's, and, and then it's like immediately corrected so i'm wondering if something like that but then what's the point of the guy being there calling the strike just just make the uh, you know, give to it, give it some type of a signal <laughs> to embarrass him when to four in a row, hey, he gets four beeps in a row. <laughs> Just make Angel Hernandez the umpire every single night. <laughs> the plate. It's payback. Uh, quickly before we wrap up, John Carlos Stanton hit a couple dingers this weekend on some fastballs, which is not something he did too often last year. That one to the left field was an absolute nuke, uh, and just wall scraper to right field, but. I don't know. Last last episode, we talked about how huh, it doesn't really look much different at the plate for Giancarlo, and then he shut us up this weekend. Yeah, good. I'm glad. I hope he shuts us up the whole time. Um, yeah, I mean he's 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 definitely turning on the ball better. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there's the the stats the stats put it out there where you know he's able to to last year not not hitting anything uh, remotely up. Hard. In the zone. I think it was like over anything 93 hard. miles an hour. He couldn't touch yeah. last year. The guy could 93 miles. Anyway. Like everybody has a 90. I mean, the fastball up in the zone has, has the fastball. fastball up in the zone has always been a problem for him. And, but now he's seemingly over the last week turning this year, turning better. Let's, I hope he can sustain it because if we get a guy uh, in the, that, that, that has the, um, the statistics of John Carlos Stanton and he's that guy again, and he's able to come back and, you know, put up the productive numbers that he has in the past. There's no stopping this team offensively. Like offensively, they're ready to go. Now, now they just need to make sure they have enough arms to be able to, you know, last an entire season. Yep. Trade for everybody on the pitching side at the deadline. Go, just revamp it. You have something, Logan? Yeah. Um, to be fair to Stan, he's always kind of a slow starter. Like every season that he's been a Yankee. Like, all right, he, you know, it's cold. You got to give him a few weeks, and then. No. Yeah. It, we were. We were. Phones I, up. I, I was, I don't know, I'm not going to speak for Scott, but I was more talking about just how he looked at the plate and just like same stance. Like physically, I know we talked a lot about how he slimmed down in the off season, but like it doesn't look that noticeable anymore. So just like the, the swings were still awkward early in the season, but you're right. Yeah, it's April 8th. Like just, there's, there's and, and time. It's time. not even so much about the weight is is that it is the 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 flexibility and rotation and the 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 limberness yeah. and obviously that does come with uh with weight loss because you're 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 working that comes weight loss comes with the way that you work out to enhance your uh you know the way that you move the way that you turn like you're you're not going to be as bulky at that point you're you're going to be more limber and you're going to be skinnier so I, yeah if he's able to turn on that on that fastball a lot more cleanly and he's able to um to to mash it into left field and pull a home run like he did because he smoked that ball what was it like it was 110 it was 110 it was, it was off a, the it was a missile i mean upper and, deck know, second level it, at left field it puts is not easy in the it puts dents in the uh in the stadium when he does that so it's exciting to see it cole also scheduled to throw a baseball for the first time this week either on monday or tuesday and that's right in line with the original schedule they said of no throwing for three to four weeks when they announced this in mid-march so he seems to be on schedule which is good hopefully they don't do it monday afternoon during the eclipse and and cole gets blinded by the light maybe maybe do it in, under the tunnel or before maybe 10 a.m out there nice nice brisk 10 a.m throwing session for garrett cole I just, yeah don't look up Whatever he does, don't look up. That's that's the guy I do not need looking up into the sun. I think he's smart enough not to not to do that though. That's gonna do it for today's episode. We'll be Domingo back. Domingo Herman is gonna be staring at the sun when he comes across. <laughs> we'll be back at you after the sure to be riveting Marlin series. We'll talk to you then.